everyone, it's Sharon Kelly from the Berwick Public Library. Because of the pandemic, we still can't have large groups meeting at the library. So we've partnered with BCTV to bring great programming out to our community. Today, I'd like to introduce you to a special guest, Thomas Hardiman, Jr. Thomas Hardiman is the keeper of the Portsmouth Athenaeum. He has over 30 years experience in museums, libraries, and historic preservation. He's been at the Athenaeum since the year 2000. Prior to that, he was the curator for the Sacco Museum. In addition to museum administration, Mr. Hardiman has ex significant experience in management, exhibition and conservation of art and artifact collections, and with sensitive conservation and historic buildings. Mr. Hardiman is here today to talk about the John Fisher family. John Fisher and his son had businesses here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and London, and they played both sides of the American Revolution. It's an interesting story where Mr. Hardiman takes documents right from the Athenaeum collection and brings them to you. And tonight we're going to hear all about his new book called Money, Revolution, and Books. Please help me welcome Thomas Hardiman, Jr. Okay, hello there. I am Tom Hardiman. I am the keeper of the Portsmouth Athenaeum. Uh, a nonprofit membership library in Market Square, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, now in its 203rd year of providing arts, culture, and literature to the seacoast. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about my recent book, Money, Revolution, and Books, uh, a multi-generational tale of the Fisher family of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, I'm going to probably sit down now. And well, if you are not familiar with the Fisher family of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, it's because nobody is. Um, in fact, uh, John Fisher, who is the primary uh, subject of the book, uh, features in dozens and dozens of books on the history of New Hampshire and the Revolution, and he gets exactly two sentences. Uh, one is, he is the brother-in-law of the province governor, John Wentworth, and the other is some random fact about something that he did. Uh, and so this is the first attempt to give a more comprehensive talk about the uh, crucial importance of not only this John Fisher, but the book actually covers five generations of different John Fishers and how they move through time. Uh, and everything revolves around books, which is appropriate for a library. Um, the uh, impetus came from a donation in 1829 when Sarah Fisher Sheaf donated the library of her brother, John Fisher of London. Uh, and uh, not much was known about it. Uh, it was received great thanks when he donated in 1829, but it was never kept apart as a separate library, so everything was just filed under its subject. In 2005, Richard Candy, who is an Athenaeum proprietor and eminent historian of the Seacoast, uh, wrote a short paper about the Fisher Library, uh, which then became an essay in our bicentennial book, the Portsmouth Athenaeum, uh, story of a collection through the eyes of its proprietors. Um, and it, um, that interested me enough to go ahead and in 2011, we went through all of the stacks and pulled apart every one of the Fisher books that was still in our collection. And once you actually had the collection in front of you, it was obvious that it was not just a London gentleman's uh, 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 s um, scholarly collection. It was in fact a um, uh, essential toolkit for development of and uh, profit making in the wilds of New Hampshire. Even though it was donated by John Fisher of London, John Fisher 
was actually a native of Portsmouth, born in 1764. Um, once we get the collection together, you notice that it, this is one of the book plates. Uh, the collection included a number of family um, legacies, including books with the book plate of uh, John Wentworth, the governor of New Hampshire, uh, engraved by Nathaniel Hurd in the 1760s. Uh, it also was obvious that it included a huge number of books on agriculture, forestry, um, and uh, managing wild lands. It included a, a large number of books on architecture and engineering, and included a, a number of books on shipbuilding and how to produce naval stores from uh, local woods. Um, so essentially, the library was a reference collection on how to get the most money out of wild lands in northern New England. Um, the progenitor of the family, uh, as I said, it's five generations of John Fishers. For the sake of clarity, we're going to call this one John Fisher Sr., even though his father was also a John Fisher. Uh, he was born in Bristol, England in 1735. Um, he was the son of a uh, wealthy distiller. Um, his older brother inherited everything when his father died. So John, this John Fisher uh, came to New England in 1761 when he was appointed as the naval officer for the uh, province of New Hampshire, and also deputy naval officer for York in Maine and Newbury in Massachusetts. Uh, very quickly, uh, he courted and married the youngest daughter of um, Mark Hunking Wentworth, Anna Wentworth. Uh, she was the uh, only daughter of Mark Hunking Wentworth. He was the port's um, wealthiest merchant. Uh, he had a virtual monopoly in the mass trade, which was the port's most lucrative export. Um, it, it, Anna Wentworth's older brother, John, ultimately became province governor. Her next brother, Thomas, would have become the um, premier merchant of Portsmouth, except that he died very young in 1768. Her parents very famously, in 1761, built one of the you know, grandest Georgian mansions in northern New England for the marriage of her brother Thomas to Anne Tasker of Marblehead. Um, not only did her parents build this magnificent house, uh, Anne Tasker's father went to um, one of Marblehead's uh, most premier furniture makers, Nathaniel Gould, and uh, bought several pieces of expensive furniture. Uh, now, John Fisher, uh, uh, they were married by Governor Benning Wentworth, Anna's uncle, in 1763. Um, and then uh, uh, he, they were immediately granted um, six uh, grants in townships in what was the disputed territory of Vermont. Uh, Vermont had been claimed for almost a century by New York, but Benning Wentworth claimed it was part of New Hampshire based on the 1741 ruling of where New Hampshire's um, uh, border, western border was. Um, and he decided that he would do this by effectively adverse possession by granting townships and getting New Hampshire settlers there, starting with the town of Bennington, Vermont, uh, and then ending in 1763 with six townships granted to his new nephew, John Fisher. Um, in 1764, Fisher and his new brother-in-law, John Wentworth, went to England in theory to 
argue the case that New Hampshire should have all of what is now Vermont. Uh, Fisher testified by telling the truth, which was that Benning Wentworth had granted townships long after the king had told him not to, uh, had granted uh, townships mostly to his immediate relatives, including his new nephew, and that he claimed two shares in every township for himself. Uh, this ended up uh, doing not so well for Benning Wentworth. In the future, it did fairly well for the Wentworth family. Um, so while he was still in England, back at home, Anna was giving birth to her first son, John Fisher Jr. Uh, and in order to take care of the family, her parents bought the new mansion that was just built on Pleasant Street that is now known as the Wentworth home. Um, it was uh, originally the Fisher home. And uh, not only did the parents buy a substantial mansion, uh, Mark Wentworth went back to Nathaniel Gold, the, fam the uh, furniture maker from Marblehead, and bought an entire suite of furniture to furnish this house, including a Bombay chest on chest that was the most expensive piece of furniture that Gould ever made. So while Anna's older brother Thomas may have had one of the nicest houses in town, Anna probably had the nicest suite of furniture. Um, so just after coming back from England in 1765, Fisher finds out that he's appointed as the collector of customs in Salem, Massachusetts. So while he's got a new namesake son, a brand new mansion, lots of fancy furniture, they immediately have to pull up stakes and move to Salem. They didn't buy a house, they rented a house on Curtis Street, which is just off of what was then King Street in Salem. Um, and uh, in the meantime, the following year, 1766, brother-in-law John Wentworth was appointed as the new governor of New Hampshire to replace his uncle Benning. Uh, whether this was by design, why Fisher had ratted Benning out, that has yet to be seen, but it, it's an interesting uh, series of coincidences. So uh, Fisher ends up renting his brand new house on Pleasant Street to his brother-in-law as the governor's mansion. Uh, this is John Wentworth, uh, and uh, Wentworth immediately makes massive improvements to the house, including imported flocked wallpaper, new mantelpieces based on designs from uh, designs based on Inigo Jones, um, and uh, uh, Wentworth finds out that because they no longer have the prospect of having free land in Vermont, he goes on a crusade to uh, capitalize on um, town grants in western New Hampshire. Um, between, there's, you'll notice there's a curved line here, which is the line of the original grant of New Hampshire from 1629 to John Mason, uh, and everything in here was part of the Masonic, what are called the, the Masonic townships, one of which was granted to John Fisher as Fisher's Field, that's right here. Um, but John Wentworth decided that he was gonna start promoting um, all the lands that were outside of that and given that he was governor, he felt that he was free to grant all the land that he wanted to. He started with a grant to himself, which was given the uh, unabashed name of Protect Worth. And, uh, and then uh, he also granted Saville. And it, uh, famously in the 1760s, he gave a grant to Dartmouth College as a way to sort of anchor this Western New Hampshire promotion. Um, and so uh, this is exactly why 
the Fisher Library is full of books on agriculture, engineering, how to drain swamps, how to clear fields, etc. It was all about how could the family get the most money out of all this land. Um, in 1768, Fisher in Salem suddenly has his um, uh, rug pulled out from under him in being accused of smuggling and his uh, position as customs collector was revoked. Uh, his father-in-law commissioned a special ship to send him back to London to plead his case. Ahead of that, his new brother-in-law, John Wentworth, the governor, sent letters to every lord and marquis and uh, Hottentot in London pleading his brother-in-law's case. And by the time the ship landed in London, Fisher's office had already been restored. So he basically didn't have to do anything. Uh, but he did pick up uh, family portraits that were um, for the Wentworth family and imported a great deal of very fancy furniture for himself and for his brother-in-law. Uh, things almost immediately on his return start going south in Massachusetts. Um, from the Liberty Incident in 1768 to the Boston Massacre in 1770, and then the uh, Port Act, which closed the Port of Boston in 1774. Um, suddenly things are getting very dangerous for somebody who's in the employ of the king in Massachusetts. So Fisher decides that he's had enough, he's going to come back to New Hampshire. So he buys, in 1774, a house on what is now Pleasant Street, uh, which was then part of Market Square. Uh, it's the, the current location of Piscataqua Savings Bank, to give you um, uh, bearings on that. And so it was a house that had been built by Nathaniel Adams. Fisher purchased it. He was there for just barely a year. Uh, in 1775, um, obviously after, the, um, after Lexington and Concord, which took place the day before Fisher's 40th birthday, <laughs> um, his arrest was ordered, as were the, the arrests of all the king's officers in New Hampshire. Uh, so he ended up fleeing out to the countryside, going down the Connecticut River to New York, which was a Loyalist stronghold at the time. Uh, his wife Anna and their children were all um, kept as paroled prisoners in Portsmouth, as was his, uh, uh, his in-laws, the Wentworths. Um, he ended up going finally to London um, and then returned back in 1777 as a member of the Carlisle Commission, which was appointed to try to negotiate a peace between England and America before the French could get in as a third party. Uh, that commission ended up failing, uh, ultimately, Fisher was able to get four of his six children released from parole. He took them back to London. The two youngest girls, Anna and Frances, stayed with the grandparents back in Portsmouth. Uh, their house was on the corner of Daniel and Chapel Street, almost kitty corner across from the uh, McPhedris Warner house. Um, yeah. Almost immediately, there were um, the New Hampshire legislature passed the Proscription Act in 1778, uh, banishing all of the loyalists. There were 70, I think, 71 people named in the act. Fisher was third on the list. Uh, soon after that, they passed a Seizure Act 
seizing all of the uh, assets of Loyalists, although this time Fisher was not named. Uh, nonetheless, in 1778, he, he uh, submitted for uh, reimbursement from the British government for losses by American Loyalists and um, uh, submitted a detailed inventory of all of his property, including his very expensive furniture. Uh, most notably, a suite of Chinese Chippendale armchairs, sofas, and uh, footstools valued at a total of 108 pounds, which was one quarter of the value of his entire estate and was worth more than most households in 1778. This suite, um, we, which was of extraordinary value, is remarkable that it still survives in the Moffat Ladd house. You can see this is one of the armchairs and, and it should be familiar to most people who have visited the Moffat Ladd house as one of the most remarkable survivals of um, American ownership of Georgian furniture. Uh, we happen to know because of an auction that took place after John Fisher's death there was a very detailed inventory taken and uh, a list of who bought what. And so we're able to not only trace what had been probably the, one of the finest Georgian interiors in northern New England, uh, but we're able to find some of the furniture is still hanging around, not just the suite at Moffat Ladd House. Um, in M Widow Mary Chase, purchased a number of things, including this um, china table made by Robert Harold in Portsmouth in the 1760s. And it is the finest example of uh, Portsmouth Rococo furniture of the time period. Uh, Mrs. Chase also purchased a suite of Gothic Revival chairs that were in one of the bedrooms. Um, these still survive in the Chase family. Uh, these are also of English manufacture. And then uh, Fisher's cousin, John Pierce, purchased yet another suite of fancy English Chinese Chippendale chairs that now survive at Gore Place in Massachusetts. So we were able to get a lot of information about this. Uh, while in London, uh, John Fisher uh, rises in the aristocracy of British officials. In 1781, he is named Under Secretary of State for all of North America, uh, which is, again, his brother-in-law had been province governor, but uh, I think Under Secretary of State is a level or two above governor. Um, he settles down on Savile Row in London in a fancy townhouse um, and also buys a row house in uh, Bath, um, which is near where he was born. He grew up in Bristol, had strong ties to the West Country. His brother lived in Bath, and so this was a chance for him to stay in touch with family and connections. Um, uh, Anna's uh, father dies in 1785 um, and normally she would uh, be entitled to inherit most of his estate except there was a prescription against English citizens uh, owning property in America. So in 1791, the New Hampshire legislature passed a, a remarkable act allowing John Fisher's children living in England to hold and sell real estate in New Hampshire. Uh, with uh, one possible exception, it's the only example 
I've been able to find of a loyalist being legally empowered to buy and sell property in America. Uh, this ends up being uh, very important both after um, Anna Fisher's mother, Madame Wentworth, dies in 1794 uh, and also um, after John Fisher himself dies in 1803. Essentially what happens is that because of this act, all of the loyalist Wentworths who are living in England and Nova Scotia start getting the Fisher children to sell all of their unimproved lands for them and it becomes sort of a, a Wentworth family cash cow. Uh, among other things, uh, John Fisher Jr. sells to the town of Portsmouth land to build a new market house. And this is the Portsmouth Market House, which is roughly where the Bank of America building is in Market Square. The Fisher House itself was on the site of this building, which is where uh, Piscataqua Savings was. Uh, one of the inheritances that the Fishers get is a property called Oak Hill, which is on the plains in Portsmouth on the way to Greenland, uh, and it's effectively where Pease is right now, and John Fisher Jr. builds a magnificent mansion, which he called Oak Hill, uh, which was just about where the Pease bus terminal is right now. And no photographs survive of it, but we have the original building contract, and it was, took the form exactly like this building in the Scottish borderlands, uh, where it had Palladian windows on either side of the central doorway, three bays to the front, uh, hip roof. Um, and um, if you are wondering how this ties in to Berwick, this is it, although it's Berwick, which is in, in the Scottish borderlands. <laughs> Among John Fisher's architectural books, there is a sketch floor plan for Oak Hill and this would have had the first circular staircase in northern New England. And it, as if the family fortunes weren't good enough to begin with, in 1799, John Fisher Sr. in England inherits four massive estates in Hampshire and uh, chooses to reside in Malsinger in Church Oakley, uh, tears down a Tudor mansion and builds this magnificent Georgian pile, which still survives. Things are going quite well. Uh, in 1800, uh, youngest daughter, Sarah Fisher, who had been left behind uh, when her parents went to England, marries James Sheaf, who lived across the Garden Gate. Um, Sheaf uh, was also a uh, quasi-loyalist. He had refused to sign the association test in 1776. He was New Hampshire's richest merchant. When he died in 1829, his estate was valued at a million dollars, although just his claims in lost shipping due to the undeclared war with France were over a million and a half dollars. So that, that's when a million dollars was real money. Uh, John Fisher Sr. dies in 1805 at Clifton Hill uh, in Bristol, where he was born, uh, in this magnificent mansion that is now part of Bristol University. Uh, his uh, grandson, John Fisher Sheaf, marries in 1828 to Mary Lennox. Uh, Lennox was the daughter of Robert Lennox, who was possibly the richest merchant in New York City, owned 30 acres of midtown Manhattan, including most of Fifth Avenue and most of what is now Central Park. 
um, uh, his children inherited uh, $7 million cash in addition to all of the property in, in Manhattan. Uh, John Fisher's senior's widow, Anna, buys another townhouse in Bath and lives there until her death in 1813 uh, for an idea of how much uh, this family real estate is worth. This townhouse just sold recently for two million pounds. So the, these were not the your, your average citizens. The daughters uh, who are unmarried, uh, part of John Fisher's 1805 will said that everything he owned needed to be uh, liquidated and the money put into a really complex trust uh, that was administered by first John Fisher Jr. and then his younger brother William. The daughters uh, bought property off of Regent's Park on Alpha Road, which Alpha being the first, that was the first road put into what is now Regent's Park. Uh, and they built Oakley House, uh, which was uh, called a villa, but this is what it looked like. This was not your country cottage. It was a magnificent mansion. Uh, and then after John, excuse me, after James Sheaf died in 1829, Sarah Fisher Sheaf went back to live in London with her sisters, many of whom she hadn't seen since 1777, when the family left. Um, so she lived there for a number of years. Her brother, uh, uh, sorry, her son, John Fisher Sheaf, who had married Mary Lennox, uh, they lived in Midtown Manhattan this is the house, uh, three houses on Fifth Avenue. This is James Lennox's house. This is John Fisher Sheaf's house. And this is Henry Etta Lennox's house. It's a, a very uh, swanky abodes. Uh, James Lennox in this house was a major bibliophile, uh, had a huge a collection of rare books, including the first Gutenberg Bible imported into America. In 1870, uh, he donated his entire library to the city of New York and built a um, fireproof building to house it. John Fisher did not like living in, or, uh, sorry, Fisher Sheaf did not like living in downtown Manhattan, and so he bought property in New Hamburg on the Hudson and built Highcliffe, um, a Greek Revival mansion. Um, you probably can't see it in this photo, but John Fisher Sheaf is standing on the stairs and his mother, Sarah, is standing in the doorway. Uh, all of her sisters died in the early 1850s, and so she came back to New York to live with her son. She ended up dying in 1863 and was uh, returned to Portsmouth to be buried in uh, what is now St. John's Church. Uh, James Lennox's fabulous library was known for many years as the Lennox Library. It is now the New York Public Library. And uh, uh, John Fisher Sheaf was a founding trustee of the Lennox Library in 1873 as part of the art collection for the library. He purchased John Singleton Copley's portrait of his aunt, Francis Wentworth Deering, no, Francis Deering Wentworth Atkinson Wentworth, <laughs> who uh, married John Wentworth the last royal governor of New Hampshire. This was in the collection of the New York Public Library until 2005 when it was sold at auction and it's now in the Crystal Bridges Museum in Arkansas. So it, when you think about 
provincial New Hampshire and the complex history of the Wentworth family. Lots has been written about Governor John Wentworth, Governor Benning Wentworth, etc. Almost nothing has been written about John Fisher, when in fact he probably has the greatest legacy of a, a New Hampshire loyalist and one can still appreciate the fine things that their family owned, both in furniture and in a fabulous library that was donated to the Portsmouth Athenaeum in 1829 and is still there. Thank you.